Good evening again. It's uh, good to be with you and I wanted to share today uh, some of the thoughts I've been having over the last week or so, the, perhaps the last 10 days really. Thoughts about grief and joy. And you might think, well, that's pretty explanatory. It's Easter. Two other words for grief and joy are death and resurrection. Of course, they're going to be on your mind. But I had other personal reasons for them being on my mind as well. My second grandchild was due on Maundy Thursday on the 9th of April. And all of last week was spent waiting each day for news of this precious child and whether he or she, because we didn't know what, or which, <laughs> was going to be born. We waited and waited and as each day went by I became more anxious. Perhaps you could say well you're not in control so that's obviously anxiety inducing which is true. But it wasn't just last week that I've been anxious. I've been anxious for months about this little child. When I was five years old, my sister was stillborn at eight and a half months pregnancy for my mum. I remember my mum going off to hospital and coming back with nothing. No baby. All the preparations that had been made were null and void. And I remember the grief of that moment very clearly. I remember the grief of trying to sit and comfort my mum as only a five-year-old might try to do. Not realising then, of course, that there would be nothing that could take that grief away, ever. And so when we were given the wonderful news that there was a second grandchild on the way, I was worried and concerned, and not least for my granddaughter, who is nearly three now. And as I watched her play with her babies and pretend to change them and cuddle them and put them to sleep and give them their breakfast and sort them out generally, all because she was excited about having a baby brother or sister. She desperately wanted a baby sister. And every time we tried to say that it might be a baby brother, she insisted she wanted a baby sister. And so for many months and many nights, I have lain at three o'clock in the morning and prayed to God. Prayed for his grace and his mercy. Prayed for his peace. Prayed for health and protection. And all the time knowing that my prayers are not magic that my prayers don't mean that actually what I want to happen will happen. There are many, many people up and down the country at the moment praying for their loved ones to be protected. And there are many, many people who are grieving for the death of their loved ones. Loved ones who have been prayed for and cared for and loved. What I came to learn as a teenager was that even though my sister wasn't known outside of the womb by me, she was known intimately by God. I did once have somebody say to me, I don't know why you miss your sister so much. You never knew her. Actually, I did know her. I knew her from the minute that my mum and dad told me that we were going to have a new baby in our house, new life. I did know her from having sat on my mum's lap and felt her kick. I did know her in all the hopes and dreams I had for having a new baby brother or sister. 
God knew her more even than me and more than my mother. God knit her together in my mother's womb. And as I watched my granddaughter Beatrix preparing for this new baby brother or sister, my prayer was that she would not have to feel the grief that I did and that my son and daughter-in-law would not have to feel the grief my mother and father did. And yet all the time knowing that those prayers were not magic, that the prayer really was for me. It was comforting for me to know that God knew that child and God knew me and knew Beatrix and knew my son and my daughter. And he was with us in the midst of everything, whatever happened. I want to read to you a bit from Isaiah chapter 12. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song and has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. On that day you will say, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the nations, proclaim that his name is exalted, sing God's praises who has triumphed gloriously, let this be known in all the world, shout and sing for joy, you that dwell in Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. I love that last verse. Shout and sing for joy, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. It wasn't just me that was praying. There were many people praying for Athena and Gareth and Beatrix. And on Saturday, when the news came at 10.30 in the morning that I had a grandson, Zephaniah, meaning bringer of hope, the joy and the relief that overwhelmed me was extraordinary. I couldn't stop crying on the phone and I probably didn't stop crying for at least an hour and a half afterwards. <laughs> Giving thanks to God that he had been in the midst of everything. We are so lucky to have Zephaniah healthy and well but many families are not at the moment. And when we do funerals, I often have a sense of me needing to hold the hope and the joy for people because they can't see that yet. The grief is too much. Grief is and always will be part of us. As I found out, the grief that I experienced as a five-year-old is still there 45 years later, is still having quite a significant impact upon my life in many and varied different ways. Grief never leaves us. We just perhaps learn to live with it. But as Christians, we hope and pray and believe that God is in the midst of us and our grief. That in the midst of everything, he is holding us and that joy will come. It might not look how we expected, like Mary on Easter Sunday. The resurrection didn't look how she expected. That wasn't what she actually really wanted in many ways. So sometimes our prayers are not answered wholly and sometimes God takes us to the absolute edge of faith and trust. He leads us beside still waters though and restores our soul and he promises joy in the morning. From Psalm 30 chapter 5 not chapter 5, verse 5. Heaviness may endure for a night, 
but joy comes in the morning. Actually, heaviness may enjoy for many, endure for many nights, many months, many years, actually, but joy will come in the morning. I don't know about you, but another three weeks of lockdown and the potential for more after that. Somebody said to me today, the worst thing is that the pubs might not open before Christmas. And I can appreciate that that is a problem. The idea of not seeing Zephaniah until perhaps he's a few months old doesn't fill me with joy. Of course it doesn't. But I have hope that I will hold him one day. So there are many things that may be troubling you today. There may be many things that are causing you grief. There may be things that you hadn't really thought about for many years, like my experience. Perhaps there are things that in this lockdown are being triggered for you from memories from past years, perhaps things that you thought you had dealt with. It's a difficult time for everyone. And our faith means we need to hold on to God. We hold on to him being in the midst of all the grief and all the sadness. And we give thanks for every single little scrap of joy that we can find at the moment. It might be your children laughing or your children dancing around the lounge. It might be a comedy programme, just something really silly on the television at the moment that makes you laugh. It might be one of those videos that's going around about (laughs) people in lockdown. There are lots of them, but they give us a smile and they give us some hope. It might be that you've made a list of all the things that you now know are really important to you. The people, the ways of life. Do you really want to do that two hour commute anymore? Do you really want to not spend much time with your family? Maybe you do. (laughs) And that's a whole different thing. There are so many things to grasp hold of in this lockdown. And if you're feeling really tired, and if you're having really weird dreams, and if you're feeling really restless, and if you're feeling lethargic, and if you can't concentrate on even reading a magazine, let alone a book, or making sense of anything else, then that's all normal for this time. Because it is a time of grief, but joy will come in the morning. Look out for the joy at the moment. And try to accept things. This has been something else I've been thinking about this week. When we use the word accept, It's sort of almost a negative word. It's like, well, you have to tolerate something. You have to just get on with it. You carry on regardless. And in some ways, when we say we accept a situation or a person or whatever is happening in our lives, it's almost a way of rejecting and resisting what is happening. We close things down, we narrow it down and we say, well, I've just got to learn how to live with this. And in some ways, that's right. We do have to learn to live with the situation we've got at the moment. We don't have any choice. We have to learn how to accept it. But actually, I've been thinking or more um, truthfully reading and thinking about acceptance as perhaps not a negative thing but as a widening and an opening of our minds and our hearts. And maybe instead of the word acceptance, we need to use the word assumption. We usually use the word assumption with Mary when she is taken up into heaven at the end of her life and 
ascends to be with Jesus. But actually, assumption means really assuming, taking on fully something that is happening. So actually, Mary assumes her status as the mother of God when Angel Gabriel comes to give her that message. We have this idea that maybe she was quite happy about that and she just accepted it and rejoiced singing the Magnificat and went, yes, yes, of course that, that'll be fine. But actually, I think God chose very wisely with Mary. She was very intelligent and very thoughtful, seemingly so. And I think she would have taken a moment or two just to allow that sense and that message to filter into her. And then there's this idea that she broadens her mind and her heart to assume it, to take it on fully. She doesn't reject any aspect of it. She takes it on fully. This is the situation. She can't change it. So she needs to make sure that she can live with it as best she can. I wonder if we could take a leaf out of her book and instead of railing against what has happened in our lives, perhaps take some time to sit and wonder about what has happened and allow some of those things into our minds and our hearts, imagining that you are widening the space, you, you're giving it a whiter space, a, an empty space for it to sit in, for it to dwell with you, so that you're not always striving to push things to the back of your head or push things away that have and are happening. Actually assuming them so that they become part of you, but part of you in a positive way rather than a negative way. And perhaps that's the part that prayer plays. Actually, all those nights where I was praying to God for the safety of Zephaniah, it was that that widened my mind and my heart and allowed me to assume whatever might come. I pray then for you all this night that you may be able to assume all that is going on in your life at the moment and that you may be truly given joy in the morning, that you may rise every day trusting that God is in the midst of all things and that joy will come. Heaviness may endure for a night but joy will come in the morning. Amen.